Welcome to Lunch of the Lord. I'm Pastor Mark, and we are in 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're continuing in verse 16 this lesson. But before we begin, Jeremiah 15, 16. Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word it was unto me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. Now, as we saw last lesson, Paul here gives a... Uh, four benefits of studying scripture, of the word of God in our life. And the first one that we saw is uh, that it is profitable for doctrine. And we studied last lesson that doctrine is absolutely vital for our life. It, it's, not, it's not enough to just read the word of God, skim through it and say, well, I read the word of God. I guess I know what God is like. No. It's, it's the responsibility of every Christian to study the Word of God. God designed the Bible in such a way that, yes, it can be read for casual reading. There are times when we can sit down on the porch or go to a park or wherever and just casually read, and that's good. But God designed his word to be studied, to be, you can, I mean, to see every single word and look up the Greek and look up the tenses and the, and the moods of the word. And you can, and the digger, the, the, sorry, <laughs> the deeper you dig, the more, the more treasures you'll find. And, and if, if you're willing to dig deep, you'll find these treasures. So he says here, the first benefit is what is it is profitable for doctrine. And the second benefit of the word of God is that it is profitable for reproof. Now, this Greek word for reproof is elegmos, elegmos, and it means to convict or to prove or to test. Now, in context of this verse, uh, it carries two ideas. There's two ideas that uh, Elegmos brings here in this context. And the first idea is that the scripture convicts a person of their sin, not, not for the purpose of finding fault, but it corrects them in order, you know, it, it corrects them of the error of their way in order to show them the right way to go. So when he says here that the word of God is profitable for doctrine and it is also profitable for reproof, the first, the first way that we look at it is that it, the word of God reproves us, it corrects us, it tests us and proves us, and, and it, it'll convict our hearts when we're walking the wrong way but it doesn't convict with the purpose of, of destroying us. It's convicting us so that we will turn to the right way. Now, the second idea of this Greek word is that it's the scriptures also reveals false teachings. And the scriptures, they lay open the false teachings and reveals them for what they really are. And then the scriptures reprove anyone who has given themselves to the false teachings. So it reproves us of sin to help, to help us to go to the right way, but it also reproves us of false teachings, just in case, just in case our ears were getting itchy for some false teachings. Just in case we were starting to be tempted to listen to other doctrines, false doctrines that will eat away at us like gangrene. So the word of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof. And then he says the third one is it's profitable for correction, right? For correction. Now, this Greek word, <laughs> give me grace on this one. This Greek word is epan or Orthosis, epanorthosis, and it's one word, and the first part of this word is epi, and it means to something. And then the second word is ana, 
which means up or again. And then the third Greek word is orthao. All right, epi, it's, so it's epi, ana, orthao. It's all one word, but it's one word that's that's a uh, 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 that we break down into three words: epi, ana, orthao. And orthao means to make something straight, to make something straight. So epi in epi in orthosis. It literally means a restoration to an upright position or to a right state, all right, to a right state of mind. So, therefore, this Greek word means to improve one's character or to improve one's life, to make one's life straight. Now, the scriptures also help to restore a fallen Christian and to show them the way in which they should walk. So when we say here that the scriptures, when Paul says the scriptures are profitable for doctrine, for reproof, and for correction, correction means to get you back in the straight and narrow way. The scriptures are never for the purpose of tearing down and for beating someone up. But the scriptures are to restore and to set them on their feet of faith so that they can receive God's love and forgiveness and, that, and be a useful servant unto God. So they're profitable for doctrine, for reproof and correction. And the correction here, <laughs> the correction here doesn't mean a bat in your hand ready to hit someone over the head with it. Right? No. It means it means that the word of the scriptures are to correct us, to to get us up on our feet again, and to get us going in the right direction, in the straight and narrow way. All right. Now, the last one that uh, the word of God is profitable for is what? For it's for instruction in righteousness. Instruction in righteousness. Now this not only means instructing someone in the word, I'm sorry, in the doctrine of righteousness, because there is such a thing as the doctrine of sanctification, the doctrine of righteousness, um, um, so the doctrine of illumination, right? The doctrine of inspiration. No, uh, it's, it's not only, it doesn't only mean instructing someone in the doctrine of, of righteousness, or imputed righteousness, and how a Christian uh, has a stand right has a right standing with God because he has uh, given his heart to God. So it's not just it's not just instructing us in righteousness and in what I'm sorry in what righteousness is, but it's in right living also. All right. It also means instructing someone in living a righteous and holy life. Yes, there is the doctrine of righteousness. I have imputed righteousness to God. God, when I got saved, God imputed, imputed to all of us his righteousness. And that's true. That is a doctrine in itself. But it's more... It's more about, Paul here is more talking about instruction in righteousness, not just to know about righteousness, but to live a righteous life. Now, as a Christian studies the scriptures, it should automatically, this, these scriptures should automatically lead them and instruct them into a more set-apart life unto God. Sanctification is another doctrine. Sanctification means to be set apart. Set apart for God's use. So as we study the scriptures, as we read the scriptures, our lives should be growing more set apart unto God. It says in verse 6, verse I'm sorry, verse 13, he says, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And if you go back to that study, it, we said that 
the uh, the law of depravity is that as people as people grow older, as long as they're not saved, they keep growing more and more into sin, more and more worse. They keep growing. I'm not saying more and more evil, but well, that's true also. But people just get more and more indoctrinated into bad living and into uh, uh, being against God and, and setting their, they're more set in their ways. And as people grow, they wax, they grow worse and worse, deceiving and dece and being deceived. So also the Christian should be, should be growing closer and closer to God. As the unsaved is growing farther and farther and farther away from God, the Christian should be growing closer and closer to God. And this is why uh, it's this is why it's important for Christians who have been saved for a long time that that after twenty years you should be closer to God in your walk, in your thought, in your thought life. The Scriptures should lead to humility, to faith to earnest prayer, to a more devoted life to God and a more dying to self and to this world system. If a person, listen, if a person can study scriptures and not be led into these things, then they are either greatly immature in their relationship with God or they are simply not saved at all. If a person can be saved, for, I shouldn't say saved, if a person can profess to be a Christian for 20 and 30 years and you know them for those years and you say there's no change in them, well, maybe they're not saved at all. Maybe they're just good churchgoers. Because as a Christian, as we, we should be growing closer and closer to, to God. And in our walk with God, our life should be more and more dedicated to God. We should be dying daily to this world and not continuing in this world as, as, as we were before we were saved. The more we study the word of God, there should be a progressive weaning away from the things of this world. It's lusts and it's pleasures and it's temptations. We should, as Christians, we should see the emptiness of these things and the temporal, temporal life of them and draw closer to eternal values, to, to that which will endure forever. As a Christian, again, we should have our hearts set on heaven. And we should have our hearts set on eternal things, not on temporal things. And, and if you're saved for 20 and 30 and 40 years, you should be that much more, that much more closer to the things of God, that much more dying to the things of this world. We should have our hearts set on these things. One of the great, listen, one of the greatest needs in the world in the worldwide body of Christ is the need for more purity. Too many, too many Christians live like the world. They talk like the world and they think and they react like the world. And it's sad to say people that are professing Christians that have, that have been saved for 10, 15, 20 years, and they think like the world, they act like the world. They still, they still swear, they still tell dirty jokes, they still do certain things, they still do these things. And, and, they, and they shouldn't. And they wonder why they have a weak prayer life, a weak study life, a weak fellowship life, right? They wonder why they have a weak weak life, a uh, weak relationship with God and a weak relationship with other believers. God wants his people to live sanctified lives, to come out from among them 
and to be ye separate. God, it's true. You may say, well, that's an Old Testament thing and we're not in the Old Testament. We're in the New Testament. No, the principle is true, right? God wants us to come out, come out from among the world and to be ye separate, to live holy lives, not to be like the world. Not, not so when people see you, they see the world. When they see you, they should see the word of God. They should see, they should see what a Christian is. But some are afraid because they will be different and begin to receive mockings and persecutions and be rejected by the world. But there are great blessings and treasures in store for the person who decides to not only profess the faith, but also to live the faith. And I know in our hearts, we all want to live for Christ. We all want to be an example. And we're all yearning in our heart for these things. But we need to make decisions to do that. We need to cut out things in our life. Every year, every year, every five years, there should be less of this world in you and more of Christ, more of the word of God, more of seeking things above. Matthew chapter five and verse eight, Jesus said what? The pure in heart will see God. The pure in heart will see God. And it's not just seeing God in heaven, the pure in heart, if, if, you want, if you want to see God working in your life today, we need to be more, the more pure we are to God, the more we live righteous unto him, the more we confess our sins and get right with God back on the straight and narrow way. The more we cut out things in our life, the more you begin to see God working in your life. I never saw that before. I saw God working at my work, right? I saw God working in my fam. I see him now. I see him working in my fam. I didn't see it before. Yeah, because you had too much world before your eyes. There's too much worldliness in you. Now you're cutting out the world and you're filling yourselves with God's word and with God's life. Now you begin to see God's beginning, the Holy Spirit's beginning to open up your eyes to see God working in, in, in all these parts of your life. When Jesus said the pure in heart will see God, he didn't mean only just to, you know, you're going to go to heaven and see God, but you can see him, him working in, in this world, in your life, in other people's lives, in your family's life. First John 3, 3, what? Every man that hath this hope in him of being like Christ will what? Purify himself. What does he say? First John 3, 2 and 3 says, uh, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Look, we have this hope in him. We have this hope in our hearts that we were gonna that we're gonna be just like him. As Jesus Christ is, so will we be. And we have that hope. But as we have this hope, it, it, we need to purify ourselves. God's not gonna purify us. He's not gonna, He's not gonna do it for us. It's something we have to do. It's it's decisions that we have to make to purify ourselves. Purity is laughed at and rejected in this world, but it should be, it should be our daily pursuit. Purity, look at, are we sinners? Yes. Will we sin till the day we die? Yes. But we can still live upright, pure lives unto God, confessing our sins and going forward. If we stumble, we get up. What does he say? righteous man stumbles seven times and he gets up, right? You're always getting up. You're not laying down in the dirt and the mud of this world. You get up and you continue walking. And and so, yes, our, our goal in this life is to, to live pure lives unto God. 
and, and to give our hearts, to give our lives unto eternity, unto the things of God. Remember, it says what? It says instruction in righteousness, which implies, it implies that we are to be instructed in the ways of righteousness or the in also in the ways of righteous living and righteous thinking. It all starts here. Living purity starts in the mind. You have to think purity. You have to decide to think purity. Decide, what does he say in, in Philippians? Uh, Philippians 4. Philippians 4. Finally, my brethren, whatsoever things are just, true, honest, pure, lovely, of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, what? Think on these things. Think on these things. Don't think on the things of this world, the hate, the anger, the pride, the, the jealousy. Don't think on those things, right? The anger you have towards this person or whatever, or, or the revenge you're going to get on that person. No, whatsoever things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely. If, it, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, right, of good report, think on these things. Right? Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace will be with you. Listen, if you want more of God in your life, then we need to live more righteous lives. More right. If you want to see God working in your life and in other people's lives, you can see it. It's there. God is working. But if you want to see it, what? The pure in heart. Who? The pure in heart will see God. The pure in heart will see God, not the dirty in heart, the pure in heart. Righteous living comes from righteous thinking and setting our minds on the straight and narrow. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm telling you, you will be absolutely blessed. You will be abs everything you've always wanted in your relationship with God, the the tremendous prayer life, the great, it's all there. It's all there, but it's in living the pure life. It's in living a righteous, it's being instructed in righteousness, instructed in the ways of righteousness. The Holy Spirit will help you to live that way. All right, until next lesson, walk with the Lord. I know he walks with you.